Okay, hello everyone. Thanks for joining. Uh, this is, uh, I'm going to welcome you to the Math Plus Seminar, the Math and Data Plus Seminar. This is a seminar series uh, jointly organized uh, by ETHA and by NYU, by the Math Group at NYU. So I'm Alfonso Bandeira from ETHA. And uh, today's, today's speaker is going to be presented by John Niles Weed from NYU. So just before we start, I just want to tell you that uh, the, the talk itself is being recorded. The question and answers afterwards, uh, we're not planning on recording, but if you have questions in between the talk, uh, they will be recorded, and John will explain roughly how to ask questions during the talk if you have them. Okay, so thanks again for joining, and I'll, I'll, I'll let John introduce the speaker today. Thanks, Afonso. So I'm John Niles Weed. I'm from the Math and Data Group at NYU, co-organizing this seminar. Uh, so we have a lot of participants today, so if you're interested in asking a question for our speaker, you can write it in the chat and uh, I or Afonso will be looking at the chat to make sure that we raise any questions that are uh, that people have there. So uh, wonderful. So without further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Philippe Rigolet from MIT. Uh, I know Philippe very well. He was my uh, PhD advisor, so uh, we go back a ways. To introduce Philippe a little bit, he's uh, one of these people who's been on the cutting edge of statistics ever since he finished his PhD. Every topic he's working on is the, the new topic that everyone ends up wanting to work on. He did great work in his PhD thesis on aggregation and model selection, important work on online learning, uh, on some of the first work on statistical computational trade-offs uh, in high dimensional statistics. And over the last few years, he's been working on optimal transport, which now everyone is working on. So, uh, so he's really a leader in this field, and I'm very excited to hear what he has to talk about today. He's going to be telling us about Bostrostein Berry Centers. Take it away, Philippe. Thanks, John, um, and thanks for this uh, overly generous introduction. Uh, it's, uh, so it's my great pleasure to be here. It's been such a long time I have been on Zoom. And uh, so I would like uh, to talk to you about Wasserstein Berry Centers, which is an object that shows up uh, in optimal transport quite a bit. And um, so I'm, I'm interested in both uh, statistical and computational aspects. So I will um, talk to you about, uh, about uh, both and uh, probably a bit more time on the statistical aspects. And so Wasserstein Berry Centers, I think, is one of the objects of statistical optimal transport that uh, displays uh, probably some of the most interesting features of optimal transport. And so I'm quite excited to present this work. Uh, I'd like to say that uh, this is, oops, this is uh, joint work with uh, a bunch of co-authors. So it's two papers that I'm presenting. Uh, Sinho and uh, Austin are uh, graduate students working with me at MIT. Uh, Quentin and Thibault are uh, faculty members and uh, Tyler is a postdoc at MIT. So I'd like to talk to you about average, right? So the average is perhaps the most fundamental notion of statistics, and it was promoted uh, in particular by uh, Ketley in the 19th century uh, by introducing the notion of average men, and that's when statistics started to be uh, pervasive to social sciences. And, uh, and, and we'll see statistics a lot, and I actually like to tell to my students that pretty much every single statistical method at some point consists in replacing an expectation by an average, and really this notion of how close this expectation is to the average is fundamental to understanding statistical performance, and uh, 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 this will be the, the, the main topic of this talk. So let's brush up a little bit. So uh, uh, on the East Coast, it's a bit early, so let's start with a very simple exercise. So if I ask you to compute the average between numbers, even if it's pretty early, you're probably good enough at doing this. And computing averages is typically something we don't really think about. This is usually the end of the road. If I reduce any problem to computing an average, probably you're good, whether it's an average between numbers or vectors. But then if I start looking at slightly more complex objects, such as shapes, then it's not really clear what the answer to this question should be. Maybe you're a machine and you're viewing those two shapes as being images with some pixel intensity, in which case the natural answer would be, well, it's the image with the average pixel intensity. But there might be other things, right? You might be looking at it from a topological perspective and, and be interested in uh, saying, well, it's something that has you know, only one hole, or maybe you want to have maybe more geometric perspective on it. And so it's not really that there's a unique notion of, sh of average shape for this more complex data. And of course, the real world is even more complicated than presenting ellipses to you. 
So for example, you could talk about brain scans, right? So I have a bunch of patients and I'm interested in understanding what the average brain scan is. And it turns out, or you could be interested in averaging, say, faces. Uh, I didn't uh, uh, pull up some images on the internet, but really all these questions uh, boil down to, or can be recast as averaging probability distributions. And this will be uh, uh, the main topic of the subject. And to understand this, we need to make a detour into optimal transport. So optimal transport was introduced in the 18th century by Gaspard Monge, who was a, a geometer. And he asked the following question. So he said, well, I have two probability distributions here, mu, which will, I will call my source distribution, and nu, which is my target distribution. And my goal is to find a map, T, that pushes mu to nu in the sense that if I look at x, which is distributed according to mu, then T of x should be distributed according to nu. And he said, okay, there's maybe potentially many such maps. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to be interested in maps that minimize the travel distance. So here I'm looking at the square travel distance between X and its image. I'm going to average this square travel distance with respect to X. And in good French tradition, I'm going to try to minimize the amount of effort I'm, I, I need to do to, to, to achieve this transport of X of mu to nu. Okay, so this is uh, the Monge problem. So uh, the notation here just says that uh, nu is the push forward of mu through t. And uh, this is standard probability notation, if you're not familiar with it. And it's just saying, again, that t of x is distributed according to nu whenever x is distributed according to mu. So that was the original formulation of Monge. And it's actually very easy to see that this does not always have a solution. And you can see this, for example, if you have a point mass. If mu is a point mass, then the image of a point mass will be a point mass for, through any function. And so in particular, you cannot push a point mass to say a Gaussian distribution, for example. And so this, uh, uh, this was a major hurdle and without knowing the work of Monge, Kontorovich actually introduced a different version of this problem. And he said, well, why should we restrict ourselves to push forward maps or push forward functions when in fact they can actually just work over couplings? And so Kantorovich uh, introduced this uh, problem in, in, in the early 20th century. And he said, okay, rather than trying to find t, uh, a, a distribution, sorry, a random variable y, which is distributed according to nu, but is in fact t of x, I'm going to allow any y, and I'm gonna allow any x, as long as x is distributed according to mu and y is distributed according to nu. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna minimize over all joint distributions that have those prescribed marginals. Minimize what? Well, minimize this squared uh, uh, Euclidean distance or this expected squared Euclidean distance, just like in the case of Monge. So it's not hard to see that this is in fact a relaxation of the uh, Monge problem. So typically this value should be smaller uh, than the, than the, the Monge problem because you're, you're minimizing over a bigger set. And, uh, and, and, and by introducing this, uh, you can check very easily that uh, two things. The first one is that when I look at the squared Euclidean distance, by expanding the square, this is really just asking to find the joint distribution of x and y, which has prescribed marginals, but also maximizes the correlation or the covariance between x and y, if they're centered, say. It's maximizing the expectation of their product. So, and the second uh, remark I wanted to make is that uh, uh, this is a linear program. You can write this as just a, a linear objective. It's an infinite dimensional linear program where you're optimizing over all joint probability distributions between X and Y. And this was in fact the birth of linear programming duality. So Kantorovich uh, 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 studied duality in this, uh, in this framework and went on to, to win a, a Nobel Prize for, for this work. So we have two problems, the Monge problem and the, and the Kontorovich problem. In principle, the Kontorovich solution sh should give you a smaller objective because you're minimizing over a bigger set. And it was not until the uh, mid 80s that those two problems were reconciled. And in fact, under some fairly natural conditions, Bernier uh, uh, showed in 87 that in fact, those two problems have the same objective, uh, have the same value. And the condition that you need is that, well, you know, you need to essentially rule out this example of point masses, and I'm gonna rule it out in a way that's a bit uh, more constrained than Bernier has done. So Bernier has a slightly more general condition, but let's say that if mu has a density, it's diffuse, and there's no need to break the mass. And in this case, there's in fact a solution to the Monge problem. 
And Bernier does not stop here. He actually gives us a structural characterization of what this uh, solution to the most problem is, what this transport map is. And he says, in fact, if it has to be optimal, then it, if, you, if you want it to be optimal, then it has to be the gradient of some convex function. This convex function is referred to as the Kontorovich potential, and we will encounter it a couple times during this talk. So I'd like you to keep in mind that when I talk about the Kontorovich potential, it is a convex function, and the Monge optimal map is the gradient of this convex function. All right, so if you look at the Monge problem, this problem is not really symmetric in mu and nu, right? It's not clear that it should be symmetric in mu and nu. However, the Kontorovich problem is symmetric in mu and nu. And when you have a symmetric problem in mu and nu, you're tempted to say, well, is this giving me some sort of a distance between mu and nu? And in fact, at the price of taking a square root for the purpose of homogeneity, you can show that indeed the objective value, so the optimum value of the Kontorovich problem. So if you take the infimum over all couplings of this expected uh, uh, squared cost, now you need to take a square root outside just so that things are homogeneous, then you end up with some symmetric uh, 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 functional of mu and nu, which is in fact a distance between mu and nu. So it satisfies the uh, axioms of uh, a distance. Uh, in particular, if it is zero, if and only if the two distributions are the same and it satisfies the triangle inequality. This distance is called the Wasserstein two distance, two coming from this two that you see three times here. In general, I could replace this two by a P and for any P larger than or equal to one, this would also give me a distance. But I would like to mention that throughout this talk, I will focus exclusively on the case of the Wasserstein two distance. Okay, so now I have a distance over probability measures. And what I'm going to do for a large chunk of this talk is to actually think of the metric space of probability distribution equipped with this distance, okay? And why do I want to think about it? Because, well, it's actually a very nice space with nice geometric properties. And, and that the fact that this distance uh, uses the underlying geometric properties of the space, right? So if you look at the definition of this distance, we're using the Euclidean distance on the ground space. Then in this case, uh, 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 um, the, uh, this distance is really capturing some geometric features of the, of the probability distributions, and this is what allows it to be a good uh, way to define averages between shapes or between images where you think there's a, an interesting geometric feature uh, showing up. So, so I want to actually talk about the average between probability distributions both when I think of them as the natural way, the one that probably we're all familiar with as just, you know, functions in L2, say, and also as the way uh, when we think of them as being just probability distribution in the Wasserstein space. So this is your famous average in L2, all right? So the average in L2, so you have this, think about having a squared integrable density for mu, a squared integrable density for nu. I'm gonna just interchangeably think of mu as being the density or the distribution itself. And if I talk about the average between two densities, well, it's one half of the first density plus one half of the second density. So in statistical terms, it's just a mixture of the two densities. And this is precisely what the average in L2 is. So if I have two unimodal distributions that are say far apart from each other, this average in L2 will give me a bimodal distribution with two bumps where uh, the two bumps are, um, where the two bumps are, uh, um, the two, uh, um, uh, are have weight one half compared to the original one. And I can, you know, play with the one half, one half, and maybe put a little more uh, weight on, uh, on one of the other. And I can define essentially a straight line in L2. L2 is a Hilbert space. So I have all these notions of straight lines. And when I mention straight lines, it's to be contrasted with the geometry that I actually see for optimal transport, where if I actually start looking at geodesics in Wasserstein two space, so the equivalent of straight lines, the shortest path essentially, then it turns out that rather than doing this average in Y space where things just start moving up and down, they actually start moving across, all right? So the average of two unimodal distributions that are far apart will be another unimodal distribution, which is essentially uh, puts most of its math halfway between where the mass of mu is and the mass of mu is. So this is a, just a, a cartoon and uh, you may ask, okay, what is in fact a geodesic in Wasserstein space? And this very nice characterization that was proposed by McCann in the 90s. Uh, 
it's uh, sometimes referred to as McCann's displacement interpolation. And the easiest way to describe what the distribution at time t on a constant speed geodesic between mu and nu is, is the following. I'm going to tell you how to draw random variables from this distribution. And the way I'm going to do it is as follows. I'm going to first draw a pair xy from the optimal coupling between mu and nu, right? The optimal coupling is the one that shows up as the uh, uh, argument in, in Katurovich's uh, problem. So I'm going to draw those two points. And then I'm just going to form a convex combination with weights 1 minus t and t, respectively. All right? So that's a very easy way to describe exactly what a, uh, a geodesic in Wasserstein space is. And we'll see that we talk about geodesic convexity, et cetera. And in, in my opinion, it's one of the most attractive part of uh, Wasserstein geometry as opposed to, for example, Riemannian geometry, where your space is described by some metric, for example. Uh, uh, this gives you immediately a complete characterization of what geodesics is, and so you can actually try to understand what's happening along those geodesics. And this is really what's particularly nice and attractive about Wasserstein space. So, moreover, so I can define shortest length path, uh, shortest length, uh, uh, sorry, so a geodesic is a um, locally minimizing curve, uh, distance minimizing curve. It turns out that this space, so P2 of RD here is the space of distributions of RRD with moments of order two, which you need to define Wasserstein two. So when I equip this space of probability distribution with the Wasserstein distance, this in fact defines a geodesic space, meaning that the distance between mu and nu is equal to the length of the shortest path between them. And this uh, is a very nice property to have. And uh, it's a very specific kind of, me of, uh, of uh, metric spaces. And those metric spaces, don't really have a differential differential structure, but they almost have a differential structure. And in fact, it's the bread and butter of metric geometry. So I, I highly recommend this textbook by Gurago Burago Ivanov that in, makes a big introduction to, to length spaces and, and geodetic spaces. And really, a large part of the game there is to see what properties of Riemannian manifolds are conserved. Uh, when you actually go to the spaces, which may be infinite dimensional, they lose a lot of the properties of the Riemannian geometry. However, there's still a bunch of things you can define on them. For example, you can define motions of curvature. So initially, and in this textbook, it's an Alexandrov notion of curvature, which is based on comparison triangles. However, there's more refined notions of curvature, such as Ricci curvature, uh, that can be defined on those geodesic spaces. And this is precisely the point of the work of Lot Storm and Villani that, uh, uh, that, was, uh, that is extremely uh, popular and influential, um, maybe about uh, 10 years, a bit more than 10 years ago. So talking about curvature, I'm going to talk about curvature bounds. Typically, this is only a bound that you can formulate. You cannot say the curvature at this point is this. Well, you could, but that would require more work. But really, here you typically give bounds on the curvature. And what we know is that the space of probability distributions equipped with the Wasserstein two distance is, in fact, non negatively curved. And the way you want to think about this is that this kind of looks like a sphere, except that it's only a lower bound, meaning that there's flat parts of the sphere. So think of a sphere which is made of like 10 and that you drop many times. And so it's going to have some flat parts and it's going to have some kinks where really you, can, you want to think about them as having almost infinite curvature at those kinks. So it's, it's very non-homogeneous, but overall, locally, it kind of looks like at least a, a flat and it's typically the way you want to think about it as being a sphere. Okay, so this will be a characteristic that will show up. I'm not going to go into detail. It's not very hard property to prove. It's based on what's called the gluing lemma. It's, it's really not difficult. So now when I have those uh, uh, geodesics, I can actually think about the average between mu and nu as just being the midpoint between mu and nu, right? This is a very natural notion of average between two points. And in fact, we also have, in those uh, geodesic spaces, we also have the usual variational characterization of average, which says that you're minimizing the average square distance to a particular point. So the midpoint is not only the point that's halfway between those guys, it's also the point that minimizes the average squared distance to the, at the end point. And so once I have this, it's not much of a jump to actually generalize this uh, to a more complex uh, uh, case where rather than having two points, I want to characterize the average between multiple points and more generally 
uh, to characterize the, uh, some sort of a notion of average of a probability distribution. So now I'm going to equip uh, my space with a probability distribution. So notice that this is a little, uh, a little uh, uh, recursive. I'm defining a probability distribution over probability distributions. So now P is a probability distribution over the Wasserstein space. So it's, uh, but really the distributions that I have over the Wasserstein space are really images, right? So you should think of P as being some random distribution from which I'm drawing brain scans, for example. And the population quantity I'm interested in is the, the minimizer of the expected squared distance, all right? So this is, if this was just the squared Euclidean norm, that would be your good old notion of uh, expected value of P. But here I have a, uh, a different distance, and this is called the Berry Center when it's over Wasserstein space, it's the Wasserstein Berry Center. And so I'm going to define the Wasserstein Berry Center as minimizing my expected squared distance with respect to P. Now, I'm a statistician, I get only endpoints from P, let's say IID brain scans, and now I'm going to define the empirical version of it where I replace my expectation by an average. When it's uh, uh, typically, uh, so you could call both of these a phrase shaming, typically the terminology is reserved when it's an average over a finite number, but those are also called phrase shaming. And, and this uh, uh, Wasserstein Berry Centers were introduced and studied uh, pretty intensively by Aguille and Carlier in 2011. And in this paper, they study mostly structural properties of the optimization problem that's here. So they look at duals, they look at various characterizations such as multi-marginal optimal transport. But really, the statistical question which says, well, how close is Bn to B star? In particular, how many brain scans do I need to collect before I know that I have a pretty good idea of what my population of, say, sick patients is, was not studied until 2017, where Le Guic and Lubez started to prove probably uh, the most uh, basic sanity check you can make on this, which is some equivalent of the law of large numbers. As my sample size grows to infinity, my Berry Center converges to the true, my empirical Berry Center converges to the true Berry Center. And this is done under fairly general conditions. And in this talk, we're gonna ask, of course, the, a slightly more quantitative version of this, which is, can I actually prove bounds, such as parametric rate, something that looks like the expected square distance between those two quantities is some term of order of variance divided by a sample size, the same way I would see that in uh, a Euclidean space and more generally over Hilbert space. Okay, so completely quantitative. Of course, you might be interested in having some central limit theorem, for example, if you're still in asymptotics. It's not really clear how you would define a central limit theorem in, in this uh, infinite dimensional space. I mean, you can. The problem is that it's not clear how you would use it. That would be essentially, you know, something to extract confidence regions over space of probability distributions. Uh, it's not an easy object to manipulate. So we're gonna focus only on trying to assess the actual expected square distance. So this is a hard problem. And so rather than solving this hard problem, we did what many mathematicians do, we solved the harder problem. And what we did is we stripped down the Wasserstein problem, the Wasserstein space of anything that's specific to it. And we just said, actually, let's just think of it as just being an abstract geomet a geodesic space with non-negative curvature. And let's try to study this problem. Okay, so we have now a more general problem where I'm defining my very center of her as minimizing some square distance, which comes from my geodesic space over this abstract geodesic space. And same thing for the empirical very center. And now P is a distribution over this geodesic space. But now I'm trying to, you know, I, I, I tell my undergraduate students that statistics has a lot of replacing expectations by averages, but I also tell graduate students that if you want to control how far they are, you need to use empirical process theory. And because empirical process theory allows you to understand uniform deviations of averages to expectations. And in fact, it looks precisely like this. So if you're familiar with empirical process theory, let's just use some notation that's a little more uh, uh, easier to manipulate. If you've never seen it, it's going to be just a, a little confusing. But essentially, we replace the integral of something dp by this linear operator p, and we replace this average of something over the xi's as this linear operator pn. And if you're trying, if you say, okay, my b star is minimizing this quantity, p of d squared, then I want to know how well bn is doing as the, at this job, right? So how well is bn minimizing this unknown quantity, because it depends on the unknown p, 
when I compare it to the actual minimizer of this functional, so that's just the uh, a minimum square distance that you could achieve if you had known what P was. And in particular, this is achieved by the true barrier center. And you know, it's a one line argument to show that if you want to control this, it's sufficient to control the supremum of this empirical process, so soup of Pn minus P of D squared. So there's two things that you might ask at this point. The first one is, well, how do I control this? If you know empirical process theory, you know it's gonna involve some you know, covering numbers and some, some entropy argument. But there's still this quantity, which is, this is not what we set out to do, right? We don't care how BN does in terms of the objective that's minimized by B star. What we want to know is how close BN is to B star. And so if you want to do this, we need to have what's called a variance inequality. So I'm gonna split this problems into two parts. The first one says, in fact, if you can give me an upper bound on this quantity, it's going to translate into an upper bound on the square distance between BN and B star. This is called the variance inequality. Uh, it has many names. It shows up a lot in, say, in empirical process theory. It actually shows up in statistics in general. But in optimization, this is what's called sometimes quadratic growth. It's the strong convexity at the global minimum of some function. Right? So it just says, at the minimum, I'm at least quadratic. So we'll come back to this variance inequality. I want to actually get out of the way the empirical process question, because this is just a standard empirical process question. You can use your favorite chaining bound, and it's going to give you something of the flavor that the order of magnitude of the upper bound on this quantity is uh, uh, square root of the log covering number divided by n. I mean, you could use some more fancy things using generic chaining, for example, but this will be enough. And so what you need to control is uh, the log covering number and uh, so, or the entropy number, this particular thing. And it turns out that Bolle, Gila, and Villani were nice enough to actually provide a, a, an upper bound to this quantity. So now if I take those two things together, maybe I can combine them using a fixed point argument to speed up my observation. So if you're familiar with this, if you're not familiar with this terms, forget about what I just said. Then when you combine those two quantities, you actually get some rates for uh, estimation. All right, so those were the first rates that were available for various centers of general distributions that were derived by Idar, uh, Kutrix, uh, Ludwig, and Paris last year. And these were uh, actually the starting point. This work was the starting point of, of what you're currently uh, listening to. All right, so rates in all dimensions. As usual, in optimal transport, you see a different behavior for dimension uh, for lower dimension. So for Wasserstein 2, you see a difference for dimension 1, dimension 2. And it looks like they could be optimal. You know, the log shows up for d equals 2. Um, this is the kind of behavior you see. However, we know that, for example, in dimension 1, Wasserstein 2 is actually flat. It's isometric to a subspace of a Hilbert space by taking the inverse CDS, right? It's completely characterized by an L2 integral. And so in this case, it's flat, so it's a Hilbert space, and for a Hilbert space, we know that the rate of convergence should be 1 over n, and in fact, uh, uh, using more of the properties of the fact of the inverse CDFs, uh, Bigo et al. did some pretty advanced uh, uh, analysis, but uh, uh, the quantitative message is that, in fact, it, is, it should be 1 over n for the case d equals 1. There's other cases, for example, if p is supported on Gaussians, where you get 1 over n, so this is the finite dimensional uh, uh, space, you're back to being on a uh, uh, Riemannian manifold, and this has been studied by uh, Krushnin, Suvarikova, and Spokoini, and I'll come back and mention this paper uh, towards the end of this talk. Okay, so as I said, if we want to get this result, we need both the empirical process theory, and that was canonical, I'm not going to come back to it, but you also need a variance inequality, and it's not clear how you would get a variance inequality. It's going to depend on some of the properties of your distribution P. So let's stare a little bit more at this variance inequality. I, I remind you what it is, all right? So if I look at my uh, expected square distance at the n minus my expected square distance at the minimum b star, then this should be lower bounded by the square distance between b n and b star. And it turns out that in the Hilbert case, if d squared is just some squared Hilbert norm, uh, Hilbert distance, then this is in fact just Pythagoras theorem. All right, so this holds with an equality with c is equal to one, and it's great. This is, uh, 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 we have it automatically. And in fact, for curved spaces, existence of such variance inequalities have been studied. And c equals one turns out that if your cur curvature is non-positive, all right, so non-positively curved spaces, they didn't really talk about them, they, they're, uh, you know, uh, 
Some spaces uh, are, this is not our interest here, but uh, some spaces are negatively curved. And in this case, you can actually show that, in fact, you're always better than uh, Pythagoras' theorem from the perspective of uh, variance inequality. So it holds for constant one. In fact, it holds for constant one for any distribution P. So you don't even need a condition on the condition P. And in fact, if it holds for any P, then this is a characterization of being uh, non-positively curved. So this is a pretty remarkable result uh, established by, by Storm uh, a, a while ago. But again, this is not our main question of interest. What we're interested in is what if the curvature is non-negative because that's the case that happens for Wasserstein uh, space of interest here. So the way we try to understand this is by saying, okay, if I want to prove a variance inequality like this one up there, I can actually just see if I take the ratio of the left-hand side to the square distance, what do I get, okay? It turns out that you can exactly characterize this. So as soon as you have some curvature lower bound, no matter what it is, then if you look at the left-hand side of the variance inequality, it's equal to the square distance that you want to see on the right-hand side, and this here plays the role of your constant, okay? So clearly there is, this is the quantity you need to control. You need to lower bound this expected function, and this expected function, this function we call the hugging coefficient, so it's written down here. Uh, on the next slide, we'll look at it in two more details. But right now, I just want to emphasize that this variance equality really uh, puts in perspective the fact that this is really the quantity we need to understand, and it's not an artifact of the proof. This is really what shows up. All right, so let's look a bit closer. Uh, notice that I pushed the variance equality on the top right, so you can keep an eye on it if you want to see where it shows up again. So what is this, this thing we call the hugging coefficient? Hugging coefficient because it shows you how well the tangent plane, so in fact, in general, it will be a tangent cone, but let's think of it as being a plane. So you have a, uh, uh, for any metric space, if you have sufficient regularity at a, at a point, and in particular, if you're on the Wasserstein space, if B star has a density, then you have a tangent plane. Then, you know, you have what's called a, uh, a log map that essentially takes you from a point on the uh, metric space and pushes you on the tangent plane, okay? And you want to know how much this map distorts distances. Now, the fact that you have positive curvature, this guarantees that this will expand distances. Distances on the tangent plane are always bigger than distances on the original space. So if you look at this quantity, this numerator here is always bigger than the original distance on the space. So I renormalize by the distance between B and B star, but this quantity here is always positive. So the one minus this quantity will be a number between minus infinity and one. If it's too negative, this will be useless. But if this thing is actually positive, I'm going to be able to turn it into an actionable uh, 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 variance inequality, all right? So my goal here will be to actually lower bound this hugging coefficient, and this hugging coefficient is essentially measuring how close, how curved my space is, because the more curved my space is, the more I expand the distances when I go back to the tangent plane. And the way we can char characterize this by some notion of some geometric notion is by talking about so we're still in this abstract metric space right so i need to tell you to use some metric notion and really all i have available are geodesics and so i'm going to talk about this notion of extendable geodesics which will allow me to understand what is a um <clears throat> what uh, how to uh, lower bound this uh, hugging coefficient so a picture is much easier to understand. So a geodesic between two points is lambda one in lambda out extendable. If I can, I start with this geodesic and I can extend it in both directions and I remain a geodesic between those new extreme points. So if, for example, if I'm on this circle here, then I can extend a little bit the geodesic beyond X and a little bit beyond V star and I will still remain a geodesic between those two points. However, if I'm in this red case, if I extend a bit between beyond X or beyond B star, then I do have still a curve, but it's no longer a geodesic. I'd better off going the other way around the circle. So geodesics, they're actually a, a shorter or more likely to be extendable, but uh, this is actually a characterization of uh, some uh, uh, properties of uh, a, a geodesic, and we'll see that we want to have this on the support of 
So uh, 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 why do I care about extendable geodesics? Well, because if I am lambda in, lambda out extendable, then in fact, I have an effective constant lower bound be, uh, on my hugging coefficient, which is valid uniformly over B and X. And here, of course, I need to have geodes to consider geodesics between B star and X. So what's interesting about this result is that I fix B star and X, and I get a, and I, I only talk about geodesics between B star and X, but this gives me a lower bound uniformly in B. And B, remember, the role of B will be played by my uh, uh, empirical Berry center, so I have no idea where this guy actually is. Okay, so now if I want to plug this back into it, I clearly know, I clearly see that I need this quantity to be larger than zero, and that will give me the variance inequality that I want. Just as a quick note, I could have an X dependent lambda in, lambda out, and average it out. We do that in the paper. I'm not gonna do it in the talk, but uh, you only need some average with respect to X and so you could actually formulate some assumptions, but here I'm going to make only assumptions on what the support of P is, so I'm gonna make assumptions uniformly in X for this lower bound to hold. Okay, so I just plugged that in. Let's assume this quantity is positive, and that gives me immediately my variance inequality as long as lambda out and lambda in are large enough. Okay, so that gives me my variance inequality. I combine it with my empirical process theory, and that gives me the slow rates of IDAR tricks at all. But in fact, now that we actually have a handle on this uh, hugging coefficient, we don't even need to use empirical process theory. We can actually adapt the proof of uh, uh, the Hilbert case, work on the tangent plane, and in that case, we get immediately from just this geodesic extendability, with the same conditions that we needed to prove this variance inequality, we actually get this fast rate sigma square over n, where sigma square is defined as, well, precisely what you would want to define as the variance of a distribution over some metric space is just the expected square distance to the center of mass. I have a factor which is four over h bar. So clearly if h bar goes too close to zero, then this thing will blow up. So it's nice for me to have an h bar which is as large as possible. If I am flat, this h bar will actually be equal to one. And so I'm gonna end up with four over uh, sigma square over n. But in fact, as soon as I have a curvature lower bound and I'm non-positively curved, so that includes the flat space, then you can show that you have this rate with a constant one. So here, it's not a typo. You can actually show that this expected square distance is bounded by sigma square over n as soon as you're non-positively curved. And of course, this includes the flat case, which is a good sanity check. You would probably not go this length to actually prove this bound for the flat case, but, uh, but uh, it's nice to see that it actually recovers the bound that, uh, that we know. All right, so I've sort of strayed pretty far from my house right now, and I, you know, I'm proving this result, and it says something about geodesics and extendability of geodesics for general non angular curve. But you might want to ask, okay, what does this mean in terms of Wasserstein space, right? I mean, I have geodesics. You told me what they look like, so hopefully, maybe I can get a handle on what does it mean in optimal transfer terminology. It turns out that you have a very nice translation in regularity of Kantorovich potentials. And uh, it says that, in fact, if your Kantorovich potentials, remember this showed up in Bernier's theorem, the Kantorovich potential, which was denoted by F0, I apologize for the change of notation, was, so my transport map was the gradient of the Kantorovich potential. So it's a convex function, so it has a non-negative uh, Hessian, say. So I'm gonna assume that everything is differentiable, uh, twice differentiable for simplicity. And uh, so when I have this uh, twice different, this Hessian, basically I want it to be smooth, meaning that the Hessian is upper bounded by beta times the identity and strongly convex, meaning that the Hessian is lower bounded by alpha times the identity. Then it turns out that this uh, uh, geodesic extendability is if and only if translates directly into strong uh, smoothness, and, uh, smoothness and strong convexity. Actually, what's interesting also is that the lambda in translate directly into smoothness and the lambda out direct, directly translate into uh, a strong convexity. So there's even a one-to-one -one correspondence between each of those guys. Okay, so now I can reformulate my uh, uh, main theorem rather than having it in terms of geodesic extendability, I can reformulate it in terms of smoothness of the 
uh, Kontorovich potential. So here again, I, I make the statement for uniformly in the support of P. So if I look at all distribution in the support of P, and I assume that when I look at the transport map between my very center to all points in the distribution, this is given by a beta smooth and alpha strongly convex potential where beta minus alpha is at most one. The reason why I need this one at most one is because I need to have my um, hugging coefficient to be lower bounded by zero strictly. So this is really telling me that I want my transport maps to actually be not too far from the identity in this very specific sense, okay? So they can be distortions of the identity, but, but really not too much, okay? And, uh, and uh, um, right, because the, the, I'm, I'm talking about the Hessian, and so, uh, uh, well, okay. Anyway, so uh, my trans, uh, so this is uh, so the quintessential case is when phi is a quadratic that will give me exactly one bit, one smooth and one strongly convex, which is the ideal case. And so I'm basically saying I don't want to deviate too much from that case when I'm quadratic, and the quadratic case translates into grad phi being a linear function. Okay, so now what I have is this bound, all right? So now my hugging coefficient becomes lower bounded by one minus beta minus alpha, so super clean, and, uh, and uh, I get this final result. So this is a nice example of, you know, really lifting this problem into something which is more complicated and then, you know, honing uh, back into uh, what we really want to, uh, to solve and this translates into some very natural, uh, 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 sorry, very natural conditions. So I'm going to switch gears now. So if there are any questions, maybe now is a, is a, is a good time to ask them. No? All right, so let's move on to algorithms. All right, so everything I described here was um, about uh, uh, talking about the minimizer of some functional. And I, you know, we live in modern days and we cannot just like assume we have access to any minimization oracle we actually have to carry out some algorithm to solve this. And we'll see that it's not entirely clear how we can actually minimize this. There's some non-convexity involved. And so if I look at uh, uh, some standard algorithms, the, probably the most popular of all algorithms these days is gradient descent. This is the greediest algorithm you can think of. And so what I want to minimize is this objective function, all right? So it's the integral, it's the expected squared distance. I will rescale it by one half so that when I take derivatives, uh, the two uh, go away. So I will call this quantity two times uh, f of b, and this will be called my very center functional. So I'm trying to minimize this f of b, and I'd like you to keep in mind that it's the expectation of something. This will be useful when we talk about stochastic optimization. Turns out I can actually write the gradient of this thing. All right, so there's a nice theory which was initiated formally by Otto and was made. Uh, um, rigorous uh, in particular in the very nice book of Ambrosio G. Savare. And you can define this notion of Wasserstein gradient, all right? So you have a functional over Wasserstein space and you want to talk about its gradient. So if you were to define the derivative, the denominator should somehow take into account the fact that distances are measured with respect to Wasserstein distance. And you can make that formal, uh, sorry, make that rigorous. And you have a gradient and this gradient in this case is very simple, all right? So here I'm going to assume that B, for example, has a density, and that's uh, quite important here. And I will actually uh, take the Bernier map, which exists uh, because B has the density, remove the identity, so that's really how much I've moved, right? So that's called the displacement map. Integrate it and take the minus sign of this, and this is actually turns out to be precisely the gradient. So once I have a gradient, I can define a gradient descent, all right? And so the gradient descent goes as follows, it says, just take beta t plus one to essentially be beta t minus eta t times the gradient, all right? So the way I, I'm actually gonna make this happen is by rather than doing beta t minus something, uh, uh, I'm actually, sorry, this should be a uh, minus sign here. And so it's going to be beta t uh, uh, push, so identity minus eta grad f of t, push bt, okay? So that's the equivalent of just making those differences. Of course, I don't want to actually say that bt plus one is bt plus something because I would need to, I need to make sense of this. If there are densities, I can, but now I'm back in L2. So I want to actually make sense of it in a optimal transport way, okay? So this would be gradient descent over uh, 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 Wasserstein space. 
So I'm actually going to, to keep this merit mistake, I think, uh, throughout. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. So I have this, uh, I have this uh, BT. Uh, I have this iterations and I also have this gradient. Okay. So I can do gradient descent. Okay. So this is what I just described here. I can unpack it a little bit. All right. So here I corrected my, uh, my sign mistake. And uh, I have, I, I have, I'm pushing BT by the identity plus eta T times this average of displacement maps. And so if you want, again, to think about it in uh, sampling ways, it's saying that if I were to sample uh, random variables from BT plus one, it would look like a convex combination of a point sampled from BT and uh, uh, an average of the push forwards of this point uh, by all of these transport maps. Okay. So that's for gradient descent. And I can also do stochastic gradient descent since after all, both the objective function f and its gradient are both expectations. So I could replace this gradient by a stochastic gradient, which is just an unbiased estimation. All right, so f again is the expected value of something with respect to some random uh, uh, distribution uh, mu over Wasserstein space. I'm doing bt plus one is equal to identity plus uh, this thing. So it's the same thing as before, except that rather than averaging, I'm just picking one, the next one, mu t, and uh, I'm drawing mu t, so those are my observations, mu one to mu n, and I'm just doing the, I'm just looking at the transport map between bt, the current iterate, and a random new point from this distribution, all right? So this is really the equivalent of gradient descent and stochastic gradient descent. If you're familiar, this should be completely transparent. And now if I write it in terms of random variables, I'm now taking the convex combination between xt and just the push forward of xt through one of the transport maps between bt and one new trans one random uh, mu t. Okay, so pictorially, this is how I move. I'm at a random, ver a random dis uh, the distribution bt. I'm tracing all the transport maps from mu1 to mu n, and then I'm uh, looking at some point along the way, and I'm averaging those points uh, to form bt plus one. Okay. If I'm doing stochastic gradient, I'm actually really just taking bt, my current point, I'm going to a random direction mu t, and I'm, go I'm, I'm stopping along the way at, uh, uh, the, according to the step size. All right, so now I'm, this is not a, uh, a completely new field, right? I'm actually doing what's called uh, uh, optimization over uh, uh, metric spaces, or over geodesic spaces, and there is something called geodesic convex optimization, for which the main point is everything you want to work for convex functions works for geodesically convex functions, right? There's this, uh, there's a, an entire book on this, but uh, there's this nice paper of my colleague Suvrit Sra uh, and a student uh, at Colt 2016, where they essentially show there's those nice tables that say, okay, here's what we get for the usual convex case. This is what we get for the geodesically convex case. And in fact, in this paper, uh, they use a very metric geometric approach to proving that uh, a master inequality that allows you to unfold all the proofs for, you know, gradient descent, mirror descent, everything you want. What is geodesically convex optimization? It says that if I take a functional F, so a function over Wasserstein space in our case, then I look at a geodesic. So I restrict F to this geodesic and I form its graph, right? So that's just F along this geodesic omega of T, then this, this function is convex. Okay, so that's geodesic convexity. So you're convex along all geodesics. And for, you know, negatively curved manifolds, this is nice because, you know, projections are contractive. For uh, positively curved, it's a slightly uh, different story. All right, so let's see if we can actually just, you know, off the shelf use this theory. Well, this, remember, this is the objective function we have. So first of all, we're not uh, 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 non-positively curved. We're actually, we have positive curvature in general for uh, uh, the Wasserstein space. And the second thing, which I think is probably the main hurdle, is that in fact, this can be concave along some geodesics, all right? So this is not a geodesic convex optimization problem. So there's no way we're using those standard results. All right, so if you look, so here we found a geodesic where if you look at, of course, the Euclidean geodesics are always uh, uh, convex because of the, of the square term here, but we can find a geodesic on Wasserstein space here. We'll see it's uh, called Buer's geodesic because we're on a, we're on a, 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 a Gaussian space, which is in fact concave. So you're in fact minimizing there's some geodesics on which you're con the, the objective you're trying to minimize is concave. 
And if you look at this objective, it's concave, but it's not that bad. And in fact, we'll be able to show something which is sort of not really, so many times you think about convexity as being the necessary condition for uh, uh, gradient descent type methods to work. In fact, it's not the case. There's a weaker condition, which is very nice to manipulate, and it's called the polyak lojastievich inequality, or PL inequality. And it's essentially telling you the following. So if I look at F of X minus the value at its minimum, then it's upper bounded by something of the order of the square of the gradient of F at X. So what is this telling me? It's telling me that if this is small, so let's look, for example, at the case when the gradient is zero, I'm at a stationary point, then in fact, I have to be at the minimizer. So in, in particular, PL inequality says that the only stationary points are the global minimizers. All right, so that's quite nice. It's essentially a quantitative version of what's sometimes referred to as quasi-convexity. Right? When you say that you're, uh, um, when you're saying that your um, uh, uh, level sets are convex. So that's one of the ingredients to prove convergence of gradient descent uh, type of results. The other one is the smoothness condition. We've seen it before. It's a smoothness of the gradient. So we formulate it like this. The Hessian of F is upper bounded by beta times the identity. So my second derivative don't blow up. And when you, another way to formulate it is to just say that F is upper bounded by, this, by, by its uh, second order quadratic expansion, all right? at uh, uh, any point, all right? So uh, between x, so this is between all x and y. So now, if you have those two ingredients, then you can actually, it's pretty standard in optimization to prove a linear rate of conversion. So what they call linear means exponentially fast and a one over square root of n rate of conversions for stochastic gradient descent, which is the parametric rate that you would expect for stochastic gradient descent in some vanilla cases. All right, so uh, uh, I'm going to skip those slides. I just wanted to show you that it's actually not difficult at all to uh, prove these linear rates when you have those two ingredients. All right, so uh, you just do a second order Taylor expansion using smoothness. Then you have a term that looks like uh, the right hand side of your PL inequality. You upper bound it by what you want. And there you go, you have your uh, exponential rate of convergence in the objective. Okay, and if you want to translate that rate of convergence uh, between f of xt to f of x star, then you need something that looks like a variance inequality, right? Something that says that if the objective values, the objective value is close to the minimum objective value, then you're actually close to the minimizer. So this is the so-called quadratic growth uh, condition in optimization, and that will tr translate directly and trivially into a bound on the distance between x and x star. So it turns out that variance inequality will play a slightly bigger role in this picture, just like it did in the uh, 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 estimation uh, picture, uh, right? So we sort of told the same story. You start by just wanting to do this final step. And in fact, it, it plays a more central role. So here I'm actually just reminding you one theorem or one corollary that I stated before, I copy pasted it, except that I didn't write the, the variance inequality because I skipped the variance inequality. I actually just wrote the bound that I had in the end. But it said, well, if all my transport maps are actually uh, strongly uh, beta smooth, uh, sorry, if all my contrivage potentials between B star and all the points in the support are beta smooth and alpha is pretty convex for beta minus alpha at most one, then I got something which in particular gave me a variance inequality. All right, so we saw that five minutes ago. And so what we prove in this work is that, in fact, you can actually go with only the strong convexity if you care only about the variance inequality. So we needed both before because we actually wanted the fast rates all the way. But if you only care about the variance inequality, you only need to have a uh, strongly convex. And of course, this strong convexity can depend on um, um, you and just like I said, you end up with uh, before you end up with an integrated uh, integrated version of the strong convexity parameter as a lower bound here. Okay, so here's your strong convexity, here's your variance and inequality, and you only need some strongly convex potential, and that's going to be important for us. Okay, so now this was the first ingredient. The second ingredient was an integrated PL inequality. I'm going to actually brush smoothness under the rug for now. It's going to be guaranteed almost. Uh, I mean, I, I'm going to, you're going to have to trust me that it's guaranteed. But what's important is to get this PL inequality, right? That was really the thing that said, maybe you're not convex, but you're convex enough that gradient descent is going to actually work. And so 
this PL inequality, I remind you, looked like this. And actually, off the shelf, you can prove a integrated PL inequality. All right, so you don't have your real PL inequality where on the right hand side you just see the squared norm of the gradient of F at B, but you see something that integrates the norm of the gradient. So it's the square is outside, you could put it inside, but uh, 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 the, the, you're integrating the gradient along a constant speed geodesic connecting your point B of interest and going all the way to your, uh, to your uh, very center. Okay, so if you want to control this, you actually need to control what's happening all along those geodesics between B and, and, and B star. Okay, and so uh, um, if we want to turn this into a uh, bona fide uh, PL inequality, which looks like uh, uh, this second line here, then we need conditions all along the trajectory of GD and SGD. Okay, so we need not only conditions on B actually, which are going to be the points along my trajectory, but on all the geodesics between all those points and my uh, B star, all right? So that's a lot of geodesics that we actually need to control and typically for which we have no control. So what are those conditions? Well, uh, those conditions are typically density that are uniformly bounded. We need also the strongly convex potentials to get the smoothness, but it turns out that all these conditions and controlling where the iterates are is actually particularly nice and elegant if P is supported on Gaussians, all right? So this is, uh, uh, I have very little time, but this is just the purpose of this uh, last part on burris wasserstein So the burris wasserstein manifold is the manifold of positive semi-definite matrices that are expressed as uh, uh, covariance matrices of a Gaussian when you equip the space of Gaussian with the Wasserstein distance, okay? This is uh, completely unbearable. You should not try to read this, but just trust me, there's like completely explicit forms for what uh, the points of the geodesics are. They're Gaussians with a certain covariance matrix, which is uh, uh, not very nice, but this is pictorially what it looks like, right? In 1D and in 2D. And so the result that we have is the following. So if we actually have P, which is supported on a subset of the Gaussians, all right? So again, you can identify these Gaussians to a subset of the Burris manifold, but we don't use any property, any Riemannian property of the Burris manifold. We only take this optimal transport perspective on things. So what do we want? Well, we want a scaling property, okay? This is easy, you can rescale everything so that the upper norm is between, is bounded by one, but we also need some bound, lower bound on the determinant of the sigmas that we take into account. And this is really this, upper bound on the density that I was mentioning, right? If you want a, density, a Gaussian density to be upper bounded, you need the determinant to be lower bounded. And then in this case, after T iterations, uh, uh, well, you get linear convergence of gradient descent with using the reasons that I, I've shown you. So if you combine this with the result of Krushnin, Suvarikova, and Spokoini on, um, on uh, empirical barrier center for this Burris case, which gives you a parametric rate of convergence, then you can show that you get the same parametric rate of convergence after only log n iterations. And, uh, and then you also have some bounds for SGD, which I did not describe, but uh, PL plus smoothness also pretty, in a pretty standard fashion, gives you uh, rates of convergence uh, for stochastic gradient descent. So uh, some simulations that show that, uh, so this simulation sort of illustrate the fact that when you talk about stochastic gradient descent, you can either sample points from your distribution or you can have points that are originally there and sample from a finite sum. Those are the usual two perspectives on stochastic gradient descent. And here we implement both. The one that, sample, that samples uh, with replacement is of course uh, doing pretty well. And uh, so the empirical barrier center, the, the message is that the empirical barrier center is probably what you should be going for, rather than making one pass on your data. There's an interesting question about the average SGD, uh, which is seem to be performing better, and we have no explanation for this at this point. All right, so uh, I'm going to uh, uh, stop on this, maybe on this final slide where I have some open questions, and, uh, and uh, I apologize for going a bit over time. Thank you.